Welcome investors to the Absolute Return Podcast, your source for stock market analysis, global macro musings, and hedge fund investment strategies. Your hosts, Julian Klamachko and Michael Kesslering, aim to bring you the knowledge and analysis you need to become a more intelligent and wealthier investor. This episode is brought to you by Accelerate Financial Technologies. Accelerate, because performance matters. Find out more at accelerateshares.com. Hey, investors, welcome to episode 34 of the Absolute Return Podcast. I'm your host, Julian Klamachko. And I'm Mike Kessler. Today is Friday, October 4th, 2019. We had a pretty volatile week in the markets, a lot going on, but we're here to hold your hand through it all. A bunch of uh, pretty exciting events on the street this week. Uh, Off the top, we had a big broker battle breaking out as Schwab dropped its trading commissions for customers to zero. How are they going to make money doing this? And is it really free? Some economic news as US PMI finally falls below 50 and a pretty ominous sign for the global economy. Is a recession imminent? Big deal in the gambling space with the FanDuel owner. They pushed all in with their $6 billion acquisition of PokerStars parent company. What is the strategic rationale behind this deal? Going to talk about a private equity deal in what we call LBO Hot Potato as Great Wolf Resorts got passed around to a third leverage buyout firm, in this case Blackstone. Can the private equity firm still add value as the third player in line. Lastly, we're going to talk about some recent money losing IPOs and if you should invest in stocks of money losing companies. A big broker battle breaked out on the street as Schwab dropped trading commissions to zero and shares of US discount brokerage firms just plummeted on that news. Now, Charles Schwab, they announced a few days ago that they're totally eliminating commissions on stocks, ETFs, and options on North American exchanges. So New York, Toronto, uh, free trades for all their clients. They're formerly between 495 and 695 uh, between them and their competitors, E-Trade and TD Ameritrade, who were effectively forced to follow suit Those two companies came out and also announced that they're dropping their commissions to zero dollars. The entire brokerage industry has really uh, come under brutal competition from an upstart, specifically Robinhood, which is a VC funded entity that offers trading services with no or low commissions via popular mobile app that they have. Now, Robinhood, it's a private company. It's valued. It was last valued in a financing round. It's 7.6 billion and it's worth almost as much as E-Trade, which is 8.4 billion. So certainly Robinhood has been a hugely disruptive force in the discount brokerage firm industry. Uh, Obviously commissions have been declining for a long time and it seemed natural uh, with what Robinhood was doing and the success they're having. That these, uh, these large firms, the incumbents, were going to be forced to drop their commissions down to zero. Brutal price action. Schwab was down 10%. Now, TD Ameritrade, their stock dropped uh, the biggest in two decades, down 26%. Now, TD Ameritrade was uh, itself specifically really vulnerable here. I mean, their uh, commissions account for almost a quarter of their revenue. So really tough uh, strategic pivot for them. E-Trade, it's another popular platform. Their stock dropped about 16 and a half percent, which was its biggest stock hit since the financial crisis. Now, there's a number of important implications here. Um, Investors might be wondering, How are they going to make money here? Uh, What are your thoughts on this recent uh, broker battle with commissions going to zero? Yeah, so it's it's really just a changing of of a point of view of something that used to be a source of revenue. Uh, being com- trading commissions and now it's more so because of of Robin Hood and some of these other robo advisors that they're now looking at this as more of a customer acquisition cost or an operating cost that they used to be able to flow through to investors no longer able to do so and so for some context in the wealth management and robo advisor industry the customer acquisition costs are you know thought to be as high as about a thousand dollars per per account so those are pretty high customer acquisition costs relative to other industries this is really just 
when you're looking at the lifetime value of each of their customers, this is really just decreasing that, which they are hoping to be able to increase their growth rates on the other side right. to be able to off, off, you know, um, balance this out. Yeah, and a lot of these discount brokerage firms are getting into the robo space. We saw Schwab a couple months back announcing that highly innovative and disruptive uh, new subscription robo advisor service, which really caused a stir in that industry. Absolutely. And what in some of the industry analysts are also mentioning uh, in their deal at analysis is that this could revive some of the M&A market in this industry. So that will be interesting to, to watch moving forward. But why don't you go into a little bit of how these brokerages make money on, on their you know, cash balances as well as the flow? Right. And so they knocked commissions down to zero, which obviously is not good for their revenue, not good for their business model. But is it really free? No. And here's why. These firms still make money off their trades. So they went from a zero, uh, a commission model to zero commissions. But what they do is they actually sell customers flow their trades to high frequency trading firm. Now what high frequency trading firms are, they're effectively a middleman. For example, say you go to a store, you want to buy a chocolate bar for uh, 95 cents. You go to the till and then uh, someone comes in between you and the, cus the cashier and uh, they buy it for 95 cents, mark up the price five cents, sell it to you for a dollar. That's effectively what high frequency trading firms are they're effectively uh, tax on the system, kind of a middleman, or a, some refer to them as somewhat of a parasite in the markets. They do bring uh, some good to the markets. They claim that they bring liquidity, more volume, easier to buy and sell shares. However, that industry is pretty profitable and they are profitable by exclusively being the middleman in between buyers and sellers. And so this really isn't free because sure, you could perhaps buy or sell shares for a zero commission. However, since your flow is being sold to high frequency trading firms, they're not in it uh, to give you, you know, the best price ever. They're not in it to lose money. Those guys, you know for sure are making money. And so you pay for this commission through a worse uh, execution prices. Basically, you're going to be paying more on each share you buy and receiving less on each share you sell on average. I would push back a little bit on the, you know, the description of, you know, perhaps, um, you know, high frequency traders being parasitic in a sense that although, yes, they do, they are just really like a tax, they're in the middle. What you've seen is that spreads for the stocks that you're buying and selling have come down, bid-ass spreads I'm referring to, have come down over the last number of years. And now not, that's not exclusively just because of these mark makers. It's mostly the digitization of trading uh, with electronic trading. Uh, but so there is some value in that. And uh, you also did mention that there is you know, liquidity that these uh, that these market makers do provide. However, some of the pushback there with the liquidity argument that they add is that there can be times when all of these algorithms act in tandem, and when the market truly needs liquidity, it's not it's not to be found at that point in time. Right, certainly, and uh, healthy environment requires biodiversity and in any sort of habitat habitat you have uh, these organisms that uh, feast off of others and they do add value and so that's kind of how i see high frequency traders in the market yeah they do add value tightening up bid ass spreads but like i said somewhat uh, parasitic in in that um you know they're just trying to insert themselves in between buyers and sellers within a transaction and so do these discount brokerage firms make money? Yes, the high frequency traders actually pay them to sell off your order flow. For example, Schwab made almost $140 million in revenue last year by selling customers orders to high frequency traders. This was up 22% from the previous year. Obviously that is pretty much Robinhood's only business model is to sell out your flow to high, fre high frequency trading firms. The other thing that I wanted to discuss is, do you think this will come to Canada? These uh, zero dollar uh, commission trades? I know I personally have a discount brokerage account with one of the big banks and I'm still paying about 10 bucks per trade. Yeah, absolutely. And say, uh, personally I use Quest Trade, um, which for that 
that I'm able to buy buy ETFs free, um, but you do get charged the commission when you sell. So they get on one side of the transaction. So not exactly free, but I would view that the likelihood of this coming to Canada in the near term or you know even the midterm is unlikely and that's just because of how the industry is set up in Canada is that the market share is really dominated by the banks who act as an oligopoly um, so they really don't have any incentive to compete against each other and start offering zero commission now if one of them did that would be very interesting to see yes yeah, certainly uh, if any one of those banks feels like competing which seems as a customer to be quite rare you typically see them all follow on and pile on to the exact same rate, whether it be prime rates, mortgage rates, but nonetheless, uh, they earn very high return on equities just because the competitive environment is so friendly. They don't really compete with each other. They're just happy earning excess profits and no one's really willing to make moves. So for consumers, obviously, we hope that it comes to Canada, but uh, we don't really see any of the big banks going out on a limb and Robin Hooding the space as has happened in the US. So, you know, fingers crossed, but uh, not looking like a high chance of probability in the near term. Wanted to touch on some negative economic data this week as US PMI fell below 50 in a pretty negative sign for the global economy. What we refer to as PMI is the Institute for Supply Management. The ISM puts out their Purchasing Managers Index, PMI. This is a monthly figure that represents manufacturing activity. Basically represents uh, anything above 50 represents growth and anything below 50 represents uh, contraction. Well, the PMI last month in the US dropped to 47.8, which was a huge miss, a massively below expectations of 50.2. So the street expecting slight growth at 50.2, but the number coming in at 47.8, which was its lowest level in over 10 years since June 2009, which was really you know, just coming out of the credit crisis. Uh, so pretty negative number. And this is really just representative of what we've been discussing ad nauseum for the past six, nine months, which is the trade war is really starting to take its toll. Uh, previous U.S. economic figures have proven that economy to be fairly resilient. We had seen in the past pretty much most major global economies coming in with uh, poor PMI figures, sub 50, signaling contraction. The US was really sailing through that, but no longer. I believe they're really the only holdout until this month with this really negative PMI print. Canada coming out today with their IV PMI, just a different provider of the same sort of purchasing managers index economic data point. That one came in for Canada at 48.7, which was a four year low. We have all these PMIs globally, sub 50, basically just a warning sign signaling global slowdown, potential recession. And this is a really key uh, leading indicator that we like to keep an eye on, um, which is obviously something important if you're const constantly on a recession watch. Got a quote here from uh, the chair of ISM's Manufacturing Business Survey Committee. He indicated that global trade remains the most significant issue as demonstrated by the contraction in new export orders that began in July 2019. Overall, sentiment this month remains cautious regarding near-term growth. Basically, we're seeing a big global slowdown due to the U.S.-China trade war and its effect on global flows. What are your thoughts on this negative economic data point? Yeah, so first I'd like to point out that another interesting data point from this is that just three out of... 18 manufacturing industries actually reported growth in September. So, you know, it, it is kind of widespread across across the different sectors within manufacturing. Um, but, you know, when, when looking at this, you know, the, the question is, why does it matter, right? Like, how does this flow through into GDP? Well, the weak demand numbers can lead to a slowdown in job creation, which then will have impacts on obviously the employment rates, as well as this weak demand will flow through into weaker GDP growth. Um, but you know, really on its own, you know, isn't the biggest of deals. But really, when looking at both this and yield curve inversion, you know, you're getting multiple red flags 
And so, you know, investors really need to take a look at this. And it's, it provides a good opportunity, as we've said before, when looking at any of this economic data, you know, it, it should be a reminder to look at your portfolio and see how you, you know, how your portfolio will re react to different economic scenarios. Um, you know, really looking to hedge out some of that volatility on the downside, perhaps. Certainly. And if you can't handle a big bear market drawdown, then perhaps you're too overly exposed to equities. There's obviously strategies, whether they be uh, government bonds or alternative strategies that are uncorrelated uh, to the markets that could have a positive performance in that sort of uh, cycle drawdown. So that's something for investors to consider is to have an asset allocation plan that you've implemented uh, that you're comfortable with that can help you maintain your investments throughout that uh, negative scenario in which the uh, global markets, S&P 500, have a pretty significant drawdown. I always call risk management something that you want to have before it happens, not uh, scrambling and panicking as the markets are really tanking. That's not something you want to do. You also don't want to dance around between being fully invested and being in cash. I think that's kind of a fool's errand. It never works. No one ever times it right. So don't think about doing that. Just craft out a well-balanced, uh, highly diversified capital allocation plan. And this includes more than just stocks to be diversified. Uh, one other thing on what we've been seeing, you mentioned the yield curve inversion. Now we're seeing uh, PMI signaling contraction. These all point to the U.S.-China trade war. And I want to note to investors that uh, this whole thing could ultimately get resolved overnight if Trump and uh, Xi can come to an agreement to resolve this trade war. Obviously, we've seemed to be close many times thus far. It's been going on for about a year already with no resolution. However, there's nothing to say that they can't ultimately come to some sort of agreement here and I believe with that, all of these issues with respect to global uh, economic slowdown, recession fears, I believe all those will kind of go away in that sort of scenario. And so investors should be pricing in some sort of odds of that. It's not like a global recession and big bear market is guaranteed here. I mean, there's plenty of different scenarios that could play out. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, investors not liking this. S&P 500 was down 1.2% on the news uh, as these ominous indicators uh, for economic growth keep, uh, they just keep coming here. We're seeing some consolidation in the gambling space with the fan dual owner, Flutter Entertainment PLC. It also owns online betting sites, Paddy Power and Betfair. And these are big uh, in Europe. They made a play to enter the North American market with their acquisition of the Stars Group, which owns PokerStars, one of the largest uh, online poker sites out there in a US $6 billion transaction. This was an all share deal, a strategic rationale. So they acquire Flutter, which is based in Ireland. They're seeking to increase their exposure into the budding US online gambling market, which is really coming to fruition. There's a lot going on uh, via government regulation and uh, players trying to get into that new market. Now, Stars Group, the target of this friendly deal, they have a pretty colored and interesting past. Now, it used to be known as Amaya, which a number of years was embroiled in a big insider trading scandal behind their acquisition of Poker Stars. And I remember uh, watching the stock back then, which was perhaps a uh, half dozen years ago, and you saw it skyrocket from kind of in the $4 range to up to $20 on all these rumors and speculation and, and ultimately the previous founder and CEO David Bassoff he ended up leaving the company as he got investigated for insider trading. Uh, the other thing is that uh, Stars Group formerly known as Amaya it was pretty uh, acquisitive. In addition to buying Poker Stars, they did a bunch of other deals such as uh, buying William Sky Australia in 2018 for 234 million. They also bought Sky Betting and Gaming in Britain for uh, nearly five billion dollars recently. Other interesting factoid is that they're minor minority owned by big entertainment conglomerate Fox. 
Nonetheless, uh, we'll talk about uh, the merger arbitrage spread here. And so you could buy Stars Group shares and short Flutter Entertainment shares, the acquire, because it is an all share deal. That spread offers a 9% annualized return, which is pretty attractive. And the market's currently pricing in a 75% chance, implied chance of success of this deal closing. One major potential issue is that of antitrust. Uh, some major uh, potential market regulatory scrutiny, specifically in the UK, where the combined groups would have uh, roughly 40% market share, which, uh, you know, any sort of market share above 30% typically gets the regulators concerned. So I'm sure they're going to look closely into that market there. Again, the betting market in the UK uh, between these two companies is quite high at about 40%. Some price action. Stars Group, they got a nice premium. Shareholders got to be happy. Stock was up 30%, 31%. And contrary to what we've seen in recent M&A news, the acquirer's stock was actually up 7%, so their shareholders liking this deal as well. What do you think about it? Yeah, so just to touch on some of the strategic rationale. So you mentioned that this was uh, the move into the U.S. market for, uh, for Flutter Entertainment, for FanDuel. And so that, you know, why their interest in the U.S. market, and we touched on this a little bit, but in our uh, previous podcast discussing the value, valuation of pro sports teams, but the, some U.S. states have made um, legalized sports betting. Um, they've, they've made that legal in the last number of months. So this is going to be an ongoing trend where really some of these players really try to get into this massive U.S. market. Um, and so that will draw some M&A as well. So you mentioned the ARB spread as well, just another to add on to the valuation uh, that, uh, that Stars Group got was a 14 times EBITDA pre-synergies, and that would be 11, 11.9 times with synergies. So synergies were about 200 million bucks? Yes, yeah, in that range. And so synergies in this situation, since there is quite a bit of overlap, there's obviously you know overlap in terms of some of the back end um, that they use, right. but the other, the other synergies would just be layoffs in terms of G and, cutting GNA. Right. Interesting. Yeah, so we'll keep an eye on this deal, but more consolidation in the gambling space. Uh, I think we're going to see that trend continue. And uh, yeah, ultimately, I think this deal is going to be a success. Shareholders of both companies really liking it here, as you say. Pretty high valuation for Stars Group, uh, nice premium for shareholders. And I think for merger ARBs here, a pretty attractive M&A spread. More M&A news this time in the private equity side with private equity firm Blackstone. They're doing a leveraged buyout of Great Wolf Resorts. The way this is working, they're acquiring a 65% stake in water park owner Great Wolf Resorts in a $2.9 billion joint venture which, with its current private equity owner, Center Bridge Partners. Now, Great Wolf, it's the largest operator of indoor water parks in North America. It has about 18 resorts and 6,000 employees and an interestingly long history of ownership by different leveraged buyout firms. For example, here, uh, Blackstone is actually the, f the third LBO shop uh, coming into play in owning Great Wolf. Uh, initially, uh, fellow private equity firm Apollo Global, they bought uh, Great Wolf a number of years ago, I believe in 2012. In May 2012, they bought Great Wolf in a leveraged buyout uh, of a public company when Great Wolf was public. And I remember it was a pretty heated bidding war with a back and forth between another firm, I believe, KSL. Uh, this deal went for $740 million in 2012, and then they flipped it. Apollo flipped Great Wolf to Centerbridge for $1.35 billion in 2015. So they only held on to it for three years. Apollo made 2.5 times its equity investment. Now, Centerbridge has held it uh, for about four years. Now they're flipping a majority stake to Blackstone. Now, this is known when firms get passed, companies get passed between LBO shops. It's known as a secondary deal. Now, there's been 54 billion worth of secondary deals so far in 2019. 
Uh, last year, there's 108 billion. Uh, the year before, in 2017, there are 136 billion. None of those have yet to top the 165 billion we saw in 2007. Uh, however, private equity limited partners do not like secondary deals. Say you're invested, uh, for example, in this transaction in both Centerbridge and Blackstone LBO funds. Well, typically when an LBO shop sells a portfolio company, they'll make a distribution to their limited partners, their, their LPs. And on the other end, when an uh, LBO shop buys a portfolio company, they'll have a capital call from their LPs to pay for it. So if you're an LP in both Centerbridge and Blackstone, you're getting a distribution from one, uh, minus a bunch of fees, and then Blackstone is calling that same capital to buy the same asset. So you're, as an LP, owning the same asset minus a ton of fees that are going to both these private equity firms. So clearly, they're not happy about that. But I wanted to talk about these so-called secondary deals specifically. I refer to this as LBO hot potato, as different private equity firms are selling their portfolio companies amongst each other at um, consistently higher prices, recognizing and crystallizing performance fees. And it really just, uh, you know, it kills the two main theses on which private equity claims to add value. Uh, the first one being operational improvements. A lot of private equity firms say, oh, we'll buy this company, we'll fix it up, we'll improve margins, improve revenue, and um, not so much lipstick on a pig, but make true operational improvements. And perhaps this is arguable for the first one, and all the data we've seen, it certainly isn't the case. Typically, they cut capital expenditures, they cut costs, they fire employees, uh, shrink revenue, and, and try to cut to the bone like that. But in this scenario, when you're the third firm that's owned a uh, private equity portfolio company, what operational changes, what improvements are you going to make that the first two missed? You know, if there are still those opportunities, then that really just shows the first two private equity firms really suck at that and they can't do that at all. The second misconception on private equity uh, that they claim they earn their market beating returns from is the notion of an illiquidity premium. But the way they earn that illiquidity premium, if they did, which I'm arguing against, is buying an asset from a discount and then selling it at a market multiple. But in this case, in a secondary deal, so-called LBO hot potato, where an asset is just trading between LBO firms, if one is selling it, or if one is buying it at a discount to recognize and earn that illiquidity premium, then the other one would lose it because they're selling the asset on the cheap. So you can't have it both ways. If one gets to earn this illiquidity premium, then the other PE firm certainly can't. What are your thoughts on this interesting uh, secondary LBO deal here. Absolutely. And you brought up a good point there at the end, especially with regards to the, the hot potato. You know, typically, you know, I guess historically, um, when the LBOs were first being done, some of these transactions were being done with uh, less sophisticated sellers. Mm -hmm. So you would come in, you know, being a private equity firm, having good valuation knowledge, and you would buy something at a discount, like you had mentioned. Well, in this scenario, you have a very sophisticated seller, so there's really no, no chance for a year or less of a chance to get a good deal on it. And as well, you kind of highlighted something, another critique, which is really in all these transactions, what was done was uh, a recap essentially. So it, when it's passed to each, um, to each different uh, private equity firm, they just add more debt to the capital structure and then you know to increase their ROE. Um, and really, you know, looking at this as well, I guess in this specific scenario, you do have to give the private equity firms a little bit of credit, uh, just because back in 2012, when Apollo had first taken it private, uh, I believe they had 11 locations. Now in 2019, they have, I think you had mentioned 18 locations. So there has been some growth in this scenario where they actually did invest into uh, capital expenditures. And I think on the deal call, uh, they did make mention that they looked forward to investing more into the business, but I would say that this would be more of an outlier transaction where they are investing into the business. The typical is, as you had mentioned, uh, focusing more just on operational improvements, really cutting those costs. Really not your traditional leverage buyout in terms of a quick strip and flip. They're looking to grow this company, so we'll see how that one turns out.
put out a blog post this week that is really fitting for today's environment. It's called Losers Average Losers, Why You Shouldn't Invest in Money Losing Companies. And I say that it's fitting for this environment because we've been discussing a lot of IPOs in the podcast lately. And if you look at the data, now north of 80% of new initial public offerings, uh, companies, uh, private companies coming to the market going public, over 80% are not profitable. Over 80% of these new companies are losing money. And we wanted to example, we wanted to examine, is investing in these money losing companies a good idea? since so many IPOs these days are of money losing companies. Now where I got this idea from for the title Losers Average Losers was one of the greatest hedge fund managers of all time. In the 80s and 90s, Paul Tudor Jones, um, he made a ton of money, especially in um, Black Monday. Uh, 1987 when the uh, markets crashed about 20%. Their largest one day drop, he was short the market and he made a killing. Uh, nonetheless, he had a sign over his screen that said losers, average losers. So he was what I call a trader's trader. He liked to um, you know, buy stocks going up and uh, short stocks going down. So if he bought a stock and it went against him, this would be a losing stock. Um, he would never average down and this is how he came up with the slogan that losers average losers. With that in mind, I posit a new rule for this day and age, uh, losers average losers 2.0. I call this one losers by money losers, being uh, contrary, the other side being winners by profitable companies. We ran the numbers here and if we look at the current market environment in North America, we look at liquid security. So pretty much anything with a market cap above 100 million. Uh, on average, there's about 450 money losing stocks per year in the market. This is roughly 15% of all publicly traded companies uh, on the market with negative EBITDA, which is representative of cash flow. We're basically saying, those are our uh, money losing entities if they have negative cash flow over the past 12 months. And we ran a simulation that would rebalance a portfolio. Basically, you'd own all the money losing companies over the past 12 months and rebalance each quarter. And what we what we realized over the past 20 years, the S&P 500 compounded at 6.4% annualized, pretty good return since 1999. Whereas the negative EBITDA portfolio, the portfolio of all the money losing stocks in the market actually lost 2.1% per year. And so over 20%, you would have lost 35% of your investment if you only invested in uh, money losing entities. Like all of these or most of these new IPOs coming to the market are not profitable. And so I just wanted to caution investors about getting too excited about those stocks because historically unprofitable companies do very poorly in the stock market and we just don't see great returns on average for all these unprofitable companies coming to the market. And that's all about we have to say this week on the Absolute Return podcast, episode 34. Hope you liked it. If you did, you can always check out more episodes on absolutereturnpodcast.com. If you really enjoyed it, leave us a review. Uh, give us a shout out on Twitter. Tell your friends about it, family members, coworkers, whatever it is. But until next week, we will chat with you soon. Cheers. Thanks for tuning in to the Absolute Return Podcast. This episode was brought to you by Accelerate Financial Technologies. Accelerate, because performance matters. Find out more at accelerateshares.com. The views expressed in this podcast are the personal views of the participants and do not reflect the views of Accelerate. No aspect of this podcast constitutes investment, legal, or tax advice. Opinions expressed in this podcast should not be viewed as a recommendation or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell any securities or investment strategies. The information and opinions in this podcast are based on current market conditions and may fluctuate and change in the future. No representation or warranty, expressed or implied, is made on behalf of Accelerate. As to the accuracy or completeness of the information contained in this podcast, Accelerate does not accept any liability for any direct, indirect, or consequential loss or damage suffered by any person as a result of relying on all or any part of this podcast, and any liability is expressly disclaimed.